Paul, if we want to understand reality uh, and ask the deep questions, which you've done throughout your career, uh, we generally do it one at a time. We talk about physics or life. And, but if, if we're sitting here now and trying to understand the, uh, uh, the nature of existence and humans' part in, in existence, what are the categories of ultimate questions? That, and, and what would be those questions that are now extant? One category that comes up always at dinner parties are origins questions. Um, and there are really three major origins questions. You've got the um, origin of consciousness, the origin of life, and the origin of the universe. That's the granddaddy of them all. Mm. And it's sort of ironical that I think we understand the origin of the universe the best of the three. Uh, the origin of life, I, I can imagine the type of explanation, but I think we're a long way from uh, getting there. The origin of consciousness, we don't really even know how to frame the, the uh, concepts which would lead to an explanation of that. Uh, but uh, all three are obviously very important, and so I would add, add those in into the category of origins questions. Okay, okay. so if, if we have those three big categories of origins, within each one, what are some of the, the, the sub-section uh, questions that are now uh, on the front burner? Well, the one that is probably easiest to address is the origin of life, because uh, there's some definite ideas around there, and that's really three problems in one. It's the when, the where, and the how. Mm -hmm. uh, when did life begin? Well, we can certainly say from the fossil record that it had established itself on Earth three and a half billion years ago. Uh, we don't know that it uh, began even on Earth. Uh, we don't know when in the preceding billion years it, it began. But we sort of bracketed that, and it's possible to imagine that we're going to one day have a pretty good answer of uh, how early uh, life on Earth uh, appeared. Uh, the where part, um, there's some interesting ideas. Darwin thought a warm little pond uh, <laughs> driven from equilibrium by sunlight. Uh, some people uh, then prefer some deep ocean setting, uh, hot rocks uh, on the ocean floor or even in the rocks uh, beneath the ocean, and that's quite a fashionable idea. Uh, other people... Uh, uh, want it to be um, in, in the oceans themselves or in a drying lagoon. I mean, there are lots of, of ideas out there. Um, all of these have some merit. No, none of them really is satisfactory at this stage, but at least uh, there are plenty of ideas uh, so, competing. Uh, so the origins of the universe, what are some of the key questions? Uh, well, uh, the key question is, was there an origin of the universe? <laughs> that, that today seems to be the issue. And during my career, the pendulum has gone back and forth. Uh, I learned cosmology from Fred Hoyle, who believed that the mm. universe had no beginning. It was right. in a steady state. Uh, but then the Big Bang theory became established, and uh, for some decades, people assumed, well, that was it. The universe began abruptly. Uh, we now know 13.8 billion years ago. That was the origin not only of matter and energy, but space and time as well. And then the, the problem of what came before it or what caused the Big Bang was sort of shoved off to one side. Um, and then in recent years, people have said, well, no, actually, the Big Bang was not the ultimate origin of all physical things. It was just a sort of local bang uh, in an eternal universe or multiverse in which there are many bangs scattered throughout space and time. And this assemblage of universes has no origin, like the steady state theory. It, it's just always been there. Um, I, I personally don't think you explain something by saying it's always been there. Uh, I think from that point of view, the Big Bang theory as, as the ultimate origin has a lot of appeal to me because we're in with an explanation of a chance of explaining how it actually happened. But just to say, oh, it's part of an eternal system and that's just there, I think is rather unsatisfactory. But, but that's the prevailing view, actually. And in the third category, the key questions of consciousness. Yes. So um, we'd like to know what is, it is that generates consciousness, what type of physical process or system has you know, thoughts, feelings, sensations attached to it. We don't know the answer to that. But even if we did know the answer, we would then want to know how did this originate, not so much uh, how does it originate in a fetus or something, but how you know, go back uh, in the history of life on Earth, at what point does something like consciousness come into existence and you get into these rather pointless arguments about is a beetle conscious and an ant and, and so on. We can't draw a, a clear line uh, between what we think is conscious and, and what isn't. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, as to when in history, 
it became part of the story of life. Uh, we don't know. You would be somewhat unique, I would say, that in taking these three categories of origins and linking them, most uh, scientists would link them on a hierarchical point of view, explaining the universe, how that happened, then explaining life, how that happened, then in one portion, one portion of the universe you have life, and then one portion of life you have consciousness. Right. Uh, I think you would take all three yes. and, and look at to solve this uh, this this equation with three unknowns with three equations simultaneously. <laughs> I, I do think as opposed link. to a linear yes. approach. I do think they link. So uh, you, so you have to justify that. Yes. Because well, I, I realize that. <laughs> so the, the conventional view is, you know, there's this big uh, impersonal thing called the universe, and then uh, you get this uh, weird phenomenon called life sort of pops up here and there. It used to be regarded as a bizarre fluke. Now it's, uh, people tend to think, well, it's sort of all over the place, um, and that uh, a subset of life, you know, you have this uh, other phenomenon called mind, uh, and these are just sort of quirky incidental things along the way, just like you get, you know, certain types of planets or certain types of crystals mm -hmm. or something. They're just a, a class of phenomena. But I've always taken life and mind much more seriously. So I, I think that the universe is set up in such a way that the emergence of life uh, is something built into its very nature. So therefore, uh, it is, um, life is a fundamental phenomenon, it's not an incidental phenomenon, and that I would say the same about mind, the emergence of mind is something which is built into the great scheme of things, it is part of what the universe is about, uh, and part of the reason that I think that is because it's through mind that we have come to under, not only observe the world, but come to understand it, uh, and I think, uh, th therefore, it's, it's a fundamental part of the story, the, the fact that we are able to comprehend the universe, that we can loop back. I mean, it's almost as if, you know, if we want to have this great chain of being, we've got the universe, we've got life, we've got mind, and then when you get to mind, it can loop back and understand the fundamental nature of the universe that gave rise to it. Uh, and, and I think all of that is not just a coincidence that just happens to be. It's not just a catalogue of facts. It's... Some, it's telling us something truly fundamental about the way the universe is put together. If in the far future we determine that life is, is rare or singular on Earth and, and, and higher intelligence is singular on Earth, would that undermine your view? Not totally, but it would uh, argue against it because I would like to feel that, uh, as I've said, that the um, emergence of life and, and mind are sort of written into the laws of, of the universe in a fundamental way. Uh, and uh, if, it, if it did turn out that it's just limited to Earth, then it would make it look like just uh, an accident, an, aber an aberration. So it would undermine that, which is why I attach such importance to finding life elsewhere. And the glib statements, oh, the universe is going to be teeming with it. If you make that statement, then you would agree with me mm -hmm. that the there is a sort of life principle, a yeah. mind principle at work in the universe. And most of my colleagues who make that statement that the universe is teeming with life will be horrified <laughs> to take <laughs> that ironic. sort of what they regard as a quasi-religious view. Right. But they've got to put their money where their mouth is. <laughs>